Okay, I think we'll get started here. Welcome everybody, welcome to our panel discussion today, Perspectives on Colleges in the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. We are here today due to the efforts of many people. First of all, we are very grateful for the funding for this event that was provided by the Office of the President. Thank you, President Oliver. Uh, we, this event was organized by the Pitzer Working Group on Israel-Palestine, and nearly all of our members are present today. We have two student members, Renan Green. Renan, are you here? To, yes. Uh, and Jonathan Asterbaum. Jonathan's here. We have two faculty members, Bill Anthes in art history. Bill back there. Um, the other one, I'm Claudia Strauss. I'm a professor of cultural anthropology. Uh, we have two trustee members, Elisa Rostin. Elisa is here. And uh, Phoebe Wood, who lives on the East Coast and could not be with us. I also want to thank Michael Bala, Associate Vice President for Study Abroad and International Programs, who made wonderful contributions to our working group last fall. So thank you, Michael. Also, I just really need to put in a word for the support that we received from Melanie Lacey in the President's Office and Carlos Alvarez in the Dean's Office. Yeah. There are going to be three parts to our panel discussion today. In the first part, each of our speakers will give opening remarks on their perspective on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. In the second part, the working group uh, has put together some questions for our panelists specifically about college's relationship to this conflict. The third part, which will begin at 5.30 and go to 6.15, will be for your questions to the panel. After the panel, there will be an even more elaborate reception in the lobby and an opportunity to speak informally with uh, everybody here today, including members of the panel. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I want to remind you that one of our community values at Pitzer is dialogue. To quote from the statement of Pitzer's community values, we support the thoughtful exchange of ideas to increase understanding and awareness and to work across difference without intimidation. We have the right to be heard and the responsibility to listen. Communication, even at its most vigorous, should be respectful and without the intent to harm. With that, I'll turn to introductions of our panelists. We are really thrilled to bring you this distinguished panel. We chose them because all three have been deeply involved in writing, speaking, and teaching about the Arab-Israeli conflict, which they approach from different angles. Uh, Yusuf Menayer in the middle. Uh, Menayer is a Palestinian-American writer and political analyst based in Washington, D.C. He is the executive director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Previously, he directed the Jerusalem Fund for Education and Community Development and its educational program, the Palestine Center. Menayer was also a policy analyst with the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. He was born in Israel and holds both U.S. and Israeli citizenship. Menayer holds a PhD in government and politics from the University of Maryland. His academic research interests include political repression and the intersection of foreign policy and civil liberties. Menayer has been a leading advocate for Palestinian rights. His writings have been published in every major metropolitan newspaper in the United States, as well as many abroad, and he has appeared on numerous national and international television and radio programs to discuss the Middle East and Palestine. In 2015, he appeared on a list of the 100 most powerful Arabs under 40. We appreciate that this is a particularly busy time for Yusuf Menayer, given the current events in Gaza, and we greatly appreciate him taking the time to be with us. Peter Beinart is a journalist and political commentator and associate professor of journalism and political science at City University of New York. He was editor of The New Republic from 1999 to 2006 and is the author of three books. He is also a senior columnist at the newspaper Haaretz. He has been a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and at New America. In 2012, he was named by Foreign Policy Magazine on its list of 100 top global thinkers. 
In his 2010 essay, The Failure of the American Jewish Establishment in the New York Review of Books, Beinart argued that the tensions between liberalism and Zionism in the US may tear apart the two historically linked concepts. He argued that by abetting Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories, American Jewish leaders risk alienating generations of younger American Jews who find the occupation to be morally wrong and incompatible with their politics. He expanded on this argument for his 2012 book, The Crisis of Zionism. Alexandra Raleigh studies and teaches about international and domestic conflicts. She holds a graduate certificate in post-conflict transitions and international justice from the International Peace and Security Institute, the Netherlands, and is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of California, Irvine. Her current research focuses on transitional justice in South Africa with particular attention to prosecutorial discretion in human rights trials. Raleigh was the education coordinator for the Olive Tree Initiative. The Olive Tree Initiative is a nonprofit academic program and student organization with chapters at many campuses in California. The Olive Tree Initiative provides experiential education in conflict zones, including in Israel, Jordan, and the West Bank. Raleigh designed and taught a 30-week comprehensive curriculum that covers historical and modern issues related to the Arab-Israeli conflict, including sessions on peace negotiations, final status issues, U.S. foreign policy, and contemporary domestic politics in Israel and Palestine. More recently, she's been an instructor in a new experiential education program on issues of race in the United States. Her experience with undergraduate engagement with the conflict in Israel-Palestine and other political conflicts make her a perfect fit for our panel today. So with that, we'll kick off our discussion. Uh, we just wanted to note that today is Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, and that discussion, this discussion is also taking place within the period marked by the Claremont Students for Justice in Palestine as Palestine Freedom Weeks. Uh, certainly, there's a political context right now that we've already alluded to, uh, recent events in the Middle East that I'm sure our speakers will address, including the recent shootings in Gaza. We ask the panelists to begin by giving us their perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at this time. And we sort of drew straws, and Peter uh, is going to go first. So with that, Peter Beiner. Um, thanks. Well, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so the Israeli-Palestinian conflict I would define as a conflict between two national movements, the Zionist movement, which envisioned uh, the recreation of a Jewish state in the land of Israel, and a Palestinian national movement that emerged in response to British colonialism and indeed in, in response to the Zionist movement itself. And I think if one asks what is distinctive about this particular moment in the state of that conflict, which has lasted um, a, a, a rough, you know, a century or more, I would say it is that the imbalance between the power of these two national movements has never been so stark. Now there has been a dramatic imbalance for for much of the conflict, and certainly since the creation of the State of Israel, since after all, it is a conflict between two national movements, one of which controls a state, and one of which does not control a state, one of which is represents a stateless people. So that in and of itself would make for a, a large power disparity. But what we've seen, I think, in recent years is that, that and it's in, in the Trump era, that the power disparity has become greater than I think perhaps at any other moment um, in the history of this conflict, which I think is bad actually for both national movements. Um, um, so maybe a, a word about why I think this imbalance has grown even starker. I think it's partly because of the economic and military strength of the Israeli state. The, um, the Palestinian national movement has been, in, re in, recently, in recent times, has been built on the notion of isolating Israel on the model of the isolation of apartheid South Africa. The, the problem is that Israel, for a variety of reasons, is, uh, I have trouble, I, ha I have my critiques of that analogy, but putting that aside, the, 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 it turns out Israel is a much harder country to isolate internationally than apartheid South Africa was. And partly it's because of the dynamism of the Israeli economy its military uh, side of its economy, but also other aspects, its agriculture, its technology, means that, that, 
Israel has a lot to offer a lot of other countries. Even governments that might, because of their own history or ideology, be inclined to have some sympathy for the Palestinian cause, Israel has a lot to offer a whole series of countries around the world. And therefore, Israel is able to maintain pretty strong relationships with a lot of countries around the world, even improving uh, its relationships with other countries in the world, even in the face of the Palestinian strategy of trying to isolate Israel. But it's not only the, the strength and dynamism of the Israeli economy, um, it's also that, you know, Barack Obama was in some ways a classic progressive in the sense that he had a progressive view of history. He, he liked to quote Martin Luther King as saying, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, which is, not, which is done to say not simply that it should bend towards justice, but that it does bend towards justice, that history has an arc which moves towards uh, non-discrimination, equality, certainly things that would lead to the end of an occupation that denies millions of Palestinians basic rights. And yet, and this is, I think, you know, in our own country, been the f kind of fascinating, in some ways, kind of debate between Barack Obama and ta -Nazi Coates, for instance. ta -Nazi Coates has responded domestically to Barack Obama and said, essentially, says who? Who says there's anything inevitable about that? And in a bizarre way, I would say Benjamin Netanyahu has leveled the same from a very different ideological position, has kind of challenged Obama in the same way, said, says who? Says who there's something inevitable? Who says there's something inevitable about the fact that the world will not accept, right? This is the kind of thing that John Kerry and Obama would say. The world will not accept in a post-colonial era, maybe I'm giving my own gloss, the world will not accept in a post-colonial era a colonial-style occupation of Palestinians who are essentially colonial subjects in the West Bank, meaning they are, su they are controlled by the Israeli state, but they cannot become citizens of the Israeli state. Benjamin Netanyahu, in a certain kind of way, it says, who says? Right? And in a way, he's been vindicated in some sense, at least in the last few years. Right? What we've seen is the rise of extreme anti-immigrant and often anti-Muslim movements across the West, and not only in the West, also very significantly in India, right? which basically um, see a certain ideological commonality with Benjamin Netanyahu's combination of free market capitalism and ethno-nationalism. Right? Um, uh, I mean, I think that the rise of Modi in India is particularly extraordinary in terms of the shift. In, if, if India stays on that trajectory, in terms of shifting the, in terms of a huge be be benefit to, to Israel, given that Israel has essentially an Indian government that is ideologically sympathetic to it, given its own kind of Hindu nationalism and its own vision of what it would like India to be. Um, and of course, I haven't even mentioned, you know, and, uh, and so you see that essentially we can have with Donald Trump, American governments have always um, favored Israel over the Palestinians. Israel's always had much more political influence in the United States than Palestinians, but never has the disparity been as extreme as it is today. I mean, it's, it's now, it's simply, a it's an absolute parody. Uh, um, um, of, uh, you know, of, of what it was in, in previous years. Um, you know, Donald Trump has basically built a team of people, all of, none of whom really have any real experience with or past sympathy or identification with the Palestinians whatsoever, right? Um, uh, to not, and no, dip, no diplomatic, no academic knowledge. Um, uh, and it's kind of, um, so I think the other thing which has tilted uh, the, 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 the conflict in Israel's direction is, at least for the time being, that you have a series of Sunni Arab governments that are so obsessed with Iran that they, Arab, you know, Arab governments may never have been particularly reliable advocates of the Palestinian cause. But I think never before that, I, since in my lifetime, have we seen leaders like the current leader in Saudi Arabia being as openly, essentially dismissive of the Palestinian cause and openly sympathetic to Israel as they are today. Um, and I think the, the, the two other points, the first, Israel has also, since the Oslo Accords, although, um, uh, it developed a quite effective form of what you could call indirect rule in the West Bank, which was to say that it's, it, Israel is basically in control of the West Bank without having to direct it, directly occupy. It doesn't have to send its own 18 and 19 year olds to every Palestinian village and town. That's one of the things that Israel realized it couldn't do in the, during the first intifada. 
the Palestinian Authority does a lot of the controlling of this area, and it's often it's funded by donors in a certain kind of bizarre way, although this has been changing in the last few weeks. Even Hamas has basically been keeping Gaza fairly, fairly quiet. So indirect rule is much cheaper than, uh, than direct rule, and so that has also made Israel's work in the West Bank and in Gaza easier. Um, and I think, finally, we're just in a particular moment in terms of American politics in which the, the kind of quote-unquote pro-Israel, let's say pro-Israeli government, because I actually, believe it or not, consider myself pro-Israel, but um, uh, 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 the, 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 the kind of pro-Israeli government forces which come from the kind of white evangelical community and a certain element of kind of older, particularly older and more religious American Jews are are particularly influential in American politics, and the forces that would be more inclined to support the Palestinian cause and try to shift American politics, by which I mean um, African Americans, um, uh, uh, maybe maybe Latinos, maybe some LGBT folks, even some uh, Arab Muslim Palestinian folks, maybe even some me younger members of the American Jewish community, younger and more secular members of the American Jewish community, don't wield nearly the degree of power in, in Washington than this first group does. Now that may change over the decades as a result of demographic shifts, but um, for the time being there's an extreme disparity in Washington, maybe not at Pitzer, but in Washington between the power of these two different groups. Um, I'll just end by saying that I think this massive imbalance is, uh, in, is a tragedy. Um, it's obviously a tragedy for Palestinians who, um, um, in various different ways, depending on where they live, are denied, um, are denied rights and um, who uh, face, I think, uh, a, a sense of, you know, a, a sense of despair that, that it's very, very, very hard to see a kind of pathway towards having the basic rights, meaning the right to be a citizen of the country in which you live, the right to vote for the government that controls your life, the right to live under the same legal system as your neighbor who's of a different religious or ethnic group, the right to move freely, right? The, 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 those seem further away than they, than they have in recent years. Um, but I also think it's, um, it's a tragedy for Israel. Um, and, and beyond that, I would say it's a tragedy, in my view, for the Jewish people. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu might not agree with me on this. Many, some members of my own community and my own extended family would not agree with this. They, they feel that given Jewish history, the greater in which Jews have often suffered terribly from our lack of power, um, and the imbalances of power that we've faced as a stateless people vis-a-vis -vis the states around us, that the greater the power disparity between Jews and their neighbors, in this case the Palestinians, the better. Um, I disagree. Um, I think that unchecked power um, is a recipe for enormous moral corruption. Um, and that, in fact, I think is what we have seen in the Netanyahu era in Israel, is the enormous moral corruption of Israeli society and to some degree of American Jewish organizational life because it's so integrated with Israeli society that comes from power, from unchecked power, power without a robust sense of moral responsibility. And um, to those in my own Jewish community, who tend to think as I do about the long scope of Jewish history, I sometimes remind, try to remind them that it is, that Jewish history is not only a story of tragedies born out of Jewish powerlessness, although that's what we always focus on in the Jewish community. It is also a story of tragedies born out of the moral corruption of Jewish power. The story of Hanukkah, for instance, which Jews tell them, talk to themselves as a story of national liberation from the, from, from the Greeks had also ended up in the creation of a Jewish sovereign, uh, of a Jewish kingdom, in fact, the last Jewish state uh, before our own, which was brought down by moral corruption. Um, so that's also part of our story. And my fear, my fear as someone who wants Israel to survive, albeit in a very, very different form than it exists today, is that we may be repeating that history and that as, that, that, um, that, the abuses that are a result of this power dynamic will one day be visited, would one day lead to not only to tremendous pain and suffering and misfortune and tragedy for Palestinians, but indeed for us as well. Thanks.
Thanks, Peter. Um, thank you guys all first, first for having us here. Um, I have to say that every time that I have an opportunity to come to a university uh, and speak um, before uh, students and advisors and faculty and staff and really see the dynamism that is taking place on campus around this issue, I am filled with uh, inspiration to continue doing the work that we do uh, in conditions that are not as welcoming to these issues often in Washington, D.C. So I thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, and before I you know, tell you about my views about uh, the, the situation on the ground, I want to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, um, literally where I'm coming from. And uh, Claudia mentioned this a little bit in the, the introduction. Uh, I am Palestinian. Uh, I was born uh, in the uh, present-day state of Israel in a town called Elid. Today it's called Lod in Hebrew. Uh, my family had been there long before uh, the state of uh, Israel was created in 1948. I'm also an American citizen, uh, and this experience has afforded me the opportunity to uh, both uh, live and interact with Israelis, live and interact with uh, Palestinians, uh, and also, of course, um, live and interact with Americans here in the United States uh, and get a very good sense of what sort of different perspectives uh, there are uh, on, these, on these issues. Um, when, I, when I look at the situation, I think it's, it's not as complicated as it is often made out to be. Uh, what you have today between the river and the sea, um, and what is Israel and Palestine, we'll, we'll call it, uh, is a state, a single state, effectively, the state of Israel, which is governing uh, over millions of people um, through a variety of different ways uh, to maintain a system of power and privilege for one group of people while disadvantaging another group of people, uh, the Palestinians. How that system manifests itself varies over space and time. Uh, at the outset, it was about denying Palestinian refugees the right to return to their towns and villages to ensure that a Jewish majority could be maintained. Uh, after that, it became about various different rights abuses in the context of a military uh, rule regime inside of the new Israeli state that governed over Palestinian citizens of Israel from 1949 all the way through 1966. After that, we also saw the military occupation, which brought the policies of martial law to the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem uh, as well. Uh, and so to this day from 1948, this system of policies has been in place uh, with the goal being, again, to maintain control for one particular group and disadvantage another. In my view, this is a textbook example of apartheid. Uh, and um, uh, I think that the response, and I think Peter actually laid out the power imbalance very appropriately. Uh, the response needs to be a similar response to the one that the international community had to uh, the uh, apartheid system in South Africa. Uh, and, you know, I will say that um, when it comes to the uh, arc of history, uh, perhaps Barack Obama was naive, perhaps Benjamin Netanyahu is right that that's not the case. But I think what we can say for sure is that that arc is not going to bend unless people pull it in the direction of justice. It was never going to bend in the direction of justice here in the United States when it came to civil rights until people put their bodies on the line before police forces that wanted to deny them the right to vote and deny them the right to cross that bridge in, in Alabama and in so many other places. It, it wasn't going to bend towards justice in South Africa until people got together and organized and demanded divestment from companies profiting off of the system there uh, and put a multi-decade campaign together to ultimately achieve comprehensive sanctions uh, at the congressional level here in the United States, which started out, by the way, very far from that. It started out in places and rooms like this and people organizing on campuses. So um, 
you know, I think we are up to the challenge of bending that arc in the direction of justice. It's a question of whether or not we're going to step up to the plate and, and make it happen. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to add a tremendous amount to what Peter said in terms of the power imbalance because I think that that part is, is, is very accurate. Um, what, I, what I would add, though, is that um, it's not just an imbalance of power directly between the Israelis and Palestinians, but there are lots of outside factors that contribute to the maintenance of that power imbalance, specifically the role of the United States, right? So uh, how many people in the room know what foreign military financing is? That's a program that we have in the United States government which gives U.S. dollars, your tax dollars, for free to countries around the world to buy U.S. weapons, okay? The State of Israel is the single largest recipient of foreign military financing in the United States. It receives over $3 billion a year to buy U.S. weapons. It is also the only country of the countries that receive this financing to have an exception written into law to allow it to directly take U.S. taxpayer dollars and invest it in its own domestic arms industry. No other country gets that exception. Israel is also one of the largest arms exporters in the world. And when you look at the per capita numbers, perhaps the largest arms exporter in the world. So we are making a conscious choice as a country and as individuals through our tax dollars to weigh into this power imbalance in a way that exacerbates it. So we have a degree of complicity as American citizens. But it's not just as American citizens that we have a degree of complicity, it's also as consumers. Because the situation on the ground cannot sustain itself if it was not economically profitable for the interests in power. And while there's an argument to be made, and people and many, uh, Peter and many other, many other people like him make the argument that it is in Israel's interest in the long term to remain Jewish and democratic, for it to end its occupation, for it to end its rule of Palestinians, and so on. But as Peter laid out, the Israelis don't agree with that, certainly not the current Israeli government. They don't agree with that because they believe that the current situation, the status quo, is not just sustainable, but it's preferable to all other options. And they come to that conclusion because it costs a lot less to keep going in this direction than it does to change directions. And that's because a lot of people make a lot of money off of the situation on the ground. And as recently as two weeks ago, just to give you an example of the intentions of the Israeli state, the transportation ministry announced that they were building a uh, billion dollar plus railway project that would extend deep into the West Bank, all the way to almost to, to Nablus, uh, and would not be completed until 2025. They have no plans of leaving anytime soon. They're continuing to invest and sink costs into, deep into Palestinian territory, precisely because they know that they can. People don't spend billions of dollars, and they have spent billions and billions of dollars deepening their economic footprint in the West Bank, monopolizing the resources that are there, taking the land, taking the water, taking the mineral resources, uh, and, and they subsidize, in fact, through the government, uh, the, the, the settlers going to live in the West Bank. So they are making it easier and easier for people to go live there because there is an, an, an agenda, clearly, to dominate that territory. We have a role to play here, and I, I know we are going to get into this more in the question and answer section, so I will, you know, I, I will leave um, it, it to that. But I would just push back and get you to think a little bit about one of these questions, because I, I disagreed with the way that it was framed, which is, do you think it's appropriate for colleges to take a stand on the conflict? Uh, it's, it's really important to question the role that we should be playing in this situation. But it's wrong to presuppose that we are not already playing a role. We are. Every single day with the tax dollars that we spend and with the investments that we make in corporations that are profiteering off of the situation on the ground. So I hope that as we continue this conversation, we can depart from that frame of mind. Thank you.
So I just want to preface my comments with I am recovering from a pretty nasty cold. So I have a kind of raspy voice and sometimes I'm hit with a debilitating cough. So I will do my best to manage it. All right. Um, a little bit about my background. So I'm primarily an educator. I do research as well, but um, I'm used to working with students on these issues. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I also do research on um, South Africa and in particular human rights prosecutions in South Africa. So I take a little bit of an international law, a legal framework perspective, and I also take um, the sometimes unpopular perspective that Israel is currently solidifying its hold on the apartheid regime that exists over the Palestinians, whether it's in East Jerusalem, whether it's in Israel proper, whether it's in the occupied territories or in the diaspora. Um, so before I start discussing my view that currently we're witnessing a real strengthening of this apartheid regime, I think it's important to just, as an educator, you know, start out with a proper definition of what apartheid is, okay? And so if we think of apartheid as inhumane acts that are committed in the context of institutionalized regimes of systematic oppression, it's a structural issue. It's a systematic issue. So when we talk about, um, and it particularly has to do with uh, the domination of one racial group over another, okay? So we always see a hierarchy in these kinds of societies when it comes to racial domination. Um, so if we talk about the arc of history bending towards justice and whether we need to pull that arc to get there, I think that that arc needs to bend towards structural change. It can't bend towards incremental change that we've seen since the peace process began in the 1990s. Um, now, I think that the definition of apartheid is universal. It's something that can be applicable outside of the South African context. So I do want to cautious us before taking a strict analogy between South Africa and what's going on in Palestine. Um, I think if we draw a, stick, a strict analogy between the two countries, apartheid South Africa and the apartheid regime that's going on in the occupied territories, um, it can risk making it seem like only South African style of apartheid is the only form of apartheid that exists. And apartheid is always going to be tailored towards the specific context in which it's created and institutionalized, okay? So we, we can't forget that. But I think that um, one of the dangers with the apartheid comparison, if we talk about South Africa, we could talk about apartheid as um, a crime against humanity in and of, of itself outside of the South African context. But I think that if we continue with the strict analogy with South Africa, we miss the fact that I believe, like Noam Chomsky believes, that the road we're headed on is actually much worse in Palestine than it was for black South Africans towards the end of the 1980s, early 1990s. Um, I think the situation is much worse in Palestine. Um, in South Africa, we had... Uh, White nationalists had a need for the black population, and that was partly because of the economic um, labor that the black population provided. But I think given this discussion of the economic superiority of Israel, particularly in the region, we can see that Israel has no need for the Palestinians. Um, in, in contrast, Israel actually wants to rid itself of the Palestinian burden, and so we see the Palestinian body being um, dispossessed almost, um, seen as a site of exploitation and lacking material value in the ways that black South Africans might have been perceived by the white nationalists. And indeed, Israel's current violence against Gaza shows that both the United States and Israel um, are both not yet convinced that a military solution is out of the question when it comes to the Palestinian problem. Um, so I'm not going to go into, we can talk more about this in the question and answer if you're interested, the analogy with South Africa, but I do want to highlight a couple concerns of mine regarding the current state of the apartheid regime and some of the developments that have been happening over time. So um, I'm particularly concerned about the continuous expansion of settlements, and in particular the expansion of settlements using the law as a, as a tool to legitimize the expansion of settlements in the West Bank. Um, one of the major mechanisms that Israel maintains its apartheid regime is through the continuous fragmentation of the Palestinian population. One of the things we've learned is that settler colonialism involves this violent rearrangement of physical spaces and indigenous people in order to give way to a new spatial and social organization of the settler class. And so if we think about how um, in late 2017, Israeli authorities began construction of new units in um, 
an East Jerusalem settlement, I don't like calling it neighborhoods, but in an East Jerusalem settlement uh, that would effectively cut off Bethlehem from East Jerusalem. Now, that's a project that had been um, on hold since 2012. But given the sort of chaotic um, position the Trump administration has taken on the conflict, uh, we saw sort of how Netanyahu has become emboldened under the, with the Trump administration to pursue um, these kinds of projects that have typically been on hold, which makes me worried because Speaking to people on the ground, we're already past the point of no return. Any settlement that is going to come in, any land swaps that are going to happen are going to involve massive relocations of people. Okay, But it worries me that we're now seeing um, an emboldened Likud that possibly would build in, say, E1, which is an area that has you know, been threatened to be built up, but has typically been sort of off limits. It's sort of like a rhetorical play. Um, so that's one issue that I have. I also believe that um, as long as the US continues to support Israel's expansionist policies, there's no reason to expect Israel to change at all. Um, so our tactics, which we can talk about later, need to focus on targeting the US and putting pressure on the US as well. Um, with support from the Trump administration, I think Israel has adopted Trump's ability to use international law to legitimize violations of international law. Um, and then in terms of the last thing I'll say about the United States is I think we really need to understand, particularly for the conflicts, that's the, the violence that's going on and perpetrated against Gazans right now, is that we need to understand American complicity in the oppression of Palestinians. And partly because I'm an academic, I take more of like an abstract perspective, but one of the ways that Americans are complicit in the continued oppression of Palestinians is through um, the legitimation of the war on terror discourse that emerged from the Bush administration, right? So the war on terror discourse that, um, you know, is in favor of unilateral action in, in, in order to save humanity from terrorism has been appropriated by Israel and used by Israel to legitimize unilateral actions of violence against people in Gaza as just. And so what we're witnessing is we live in a time when political violence has become conflated with criminal violence and when all forms of resistance are redefined as terror. And I think we need to seek an alternative discourse to, to talk about these issues because the war on terror discourse is just working to further solidify the oppression and the violence that's being perpetrated against Palestinians. And then finally, in terms of the nonviolent resistance that we see going on in Gaza right now, I think it's particularly interesting because since the end of the first intifada, we've seen um, almost a resistance to nonviolent resistance in the Palestinian territories. And this is a reductionist statement, so please know there's always going to be groups that don't resist nonviolence. Um, but that's partly because, you know, a lot of Palestinian nonviolent resistance campaigns have been funded by the West and, in, in fact, directed by the West in ways that conflict with the actual goals of Palestinians on the ground. Um, and I think partly because uh, things are increasingly desperate in the occupied territories, the violence becomes a means of gaining social capital and funding from outside sources. Um, but the acts of mass mobilization that we've been seeing in the recent weeks almost reflects this um, reclaiming of the resistance agenda, in my opinion. Um, Palestinians are increasingly noticing that they are on their own, right? There was initial hope that the Trump administration would prove to be a different sort of factor in the equation. And I think after talking with folks uh, the last time I was there this summer, I, I don't see that being the case anymore. And so this idea that Palestinians are on their own and need to come up with their own forms of resistance is very similar to what we saw during the first intifada. Um, now, we'll see if the... Um, the support for nonviolence that we see in Gaza right now um, will continue, or if the fragmentation that's created by Israeli policies and the Israeli system of apartheid is gonna actually work to fragment the resistance movements that we see in Palestine. Um, so I, I, I'm interested to see where this goes. I don't necessarily advocate for uh, intifada of violence because that means a lot of Palestinians are going to die. Um, but I would be interested to see where this nonviolence takes us. <laughs>
Uh, the original plan was to move right into the second part, but uh, I'd just like to give Peter a chance, if you'd like, as you said as part of your remarks, that you actually don't agree with the analogy with South Africa. And I'm just wondering if you want to say more about that. Right. So so I guess I'll say two things. First of all, uh, to take Alex's point, um, South, making an analogy with South Africa and, and, and using the term apartheid are not, are not the same things, right? Apartheid can be a broader term than just South Africa. But let me, let me explain why I have problems both with the South African analogy and with the apartheid uh, language. Um, um, the, um, in South Africa, um, uh, there were no group of black South Africans who had, um, who had the right to vote. Um, who were citizens of the country and who were who were represented in parliament um, and who essentially lived under the same law um, as Palestinians as citizens of Israel are. Now, that is not to say that Palestinian citizens of Israel don't suffer structural discrimination. They absolutely do. Um, but uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel rep elect representatives who go to the Knesset and from the, from the Knesset call Israel an apartheid state. That would have been absolutely impossible in apartheid South Africa. Um, the, the problem that now, the, now Alice makes the important point that apartheid conceptually can be broader than the specific circumstances of, of the South African regime that existed from when the nationalists took over in the late 1940s until 1994. My concern about that broader definition of apartheid um, is that, it, you know, which is basically the domination of one group over another. Um, um, uh, to put it kind of crudely, is that I, it seems, strikes me as so broad that it seems to me by this definition we would call many of the countries in the Middle East apartheid states, for instance. I mean, it would seem to me if one looks at the relationship between Sunni and Shia um, in much of the Gulf, we would have to say that those countries are also apartheid states. If you look at the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims, and also Persians and non-Persians in Iran, we would say that Iran is an apartheid state. If we look at the relationship between Copts, Coptic Christians, and Muslims in, in Egypt, we would call Egypt an apartheid state. It seems to me that, that, that you, can, you, you could use that definition. That definition is particularly focused on, on, South, on Israel for a variety of reasons. And I think, as I've made clear, um, I am a... a um, uh, not someone uh, who takes Israel's human rights abuses lightly. Um, but I think that the apartheid term, if we're going to be, if we're going to use it in that broad a fashion, actually is going to include quite a whole, a whole range of different countries um, uh, beyond just Israel, which is part of the reason, which is why I'm not sure it's actually that useful. F to me, what is useful is to talk in specific terms about the legal regimes that exist and the rights that Palestinians do or do not have in different places. Um, I think, first of all, it's more useful because it's more specific. Um, I also know from personal experience as someone who lives and talks a lot in the American Jewish community, it's much, it's, it's more effective to actually say, look, this group of people here is living under a different legal regime than their Jewish neighbors in the West Bank. They don't have the right to vote for the Israeli government, even though the Israeli government controls their lives in all of these different ways, right? You get a better, more of a hearing than using terms like apartheid, which, ba which have taken on the connotation, certainly in the American Jewish community, as basically uh, expressions of just venom of, against, against Israel. So it's for those reasons that, I, that those are, these are not analogies and language that I find particularly helpful. Um, okay, so one of the things we have to remember with the definition of apartheid conceptually is that it involves intention, okay? So we can do the slippery slope argument and say that now every state is an apartheid state, but you have to assess it with regards to intention of maintaining a regime of racial domination, which I'm not sure every state is gonna live up to. Also, what's wrong with saying that other states are apartheid states? If structural issues are the problem here, and an apartheid isn't a structural issue, what is the problem with calling out states for having regimes of apartheid? I don't see anything wrong with that. I think it actually gives us a conceptual lens that we can target these specific rights that, that Peter is talking about. I also think this idea that we need to moderate our language to make people feel better about what's going on in the region um, is problematic. It's the That's same- That's actually not what I said, but go ahead. Well, 
It's the same way of saying that um, white Americans do not like hearing that they're racist because it's something that th makes them think they're the KKK and uh, it's just filled with venom and hate and usually against whiteness. That's not the case. That's what the people who are listening are attributing to those statements. And I think the problem is, is we're being asked to modify our language and the reality of the situation so that people hear us better. Now, that's not to say that we can't be strategic in the way that we talk to various communities, okay? I tell my students, you know, it doesn't help to go to the university and say, you're racist, <laughs> because the university doesn't want to hear it. But it does mean that we need to change the way we talk about things, but also convey the same message and not sacrifice sort of what we're trying to convey. So while you may not have been saying that we need to soften our language, that's what I heard, right? And does that mean that you need to alter the way you're talking just because I'm hearing you wrong? No, I can, just, I can explain it again. Yeah, I, I, just very, very briefly, I think one of the reasons that the Israelis do not want to be talking about apartheid is precisely because there are legal consequences to that, right? Apartheid is a crime against humanity and under international law, there is a Rome statute that defines what apartheid is, um, and uh, as, as you've mentioned, it includes, uh, you know, an, an intent, uh, and, you know, I, there are plenty of other very, very, very repressive states, not just in the Middle East, by the way, but around the world, uh, where minorities of all different stripes do not have the kind of equal access to power in society that they deserve. I don't know too many other states that refer to minorities from the day that they are born as demographic threats to the state, and then craft policies to ensure that those uh, demographic threats are never able to be in a position where they could assume enough political power that they could actually change the demographic character of the state. That is, that is where the policies of the state of, of Israel depart from. You can see that in the crafting of laws at the very beginning of the state, from the ways in which they decided to permit the re return of Jewish individuals from around the world to Israel, but deny return to Palestinian refugees precisely because they were not Jewish, they were Palestinian, all the way through laws that have been made in recent years that, for example, deny people like me, Israeli citizens, of living with their Palestinian spouses from the West Bank in our town of birth and, and residence. Why? Because my wife is a demographic threat and her coming over may be demographic spillover. And if we have a child over there, that's an additional demographic threat. I don't know, I mean, again, no shortage of messed up countries in the world. This is kind of unique. And when it comes to you know, the, the term apartheid and the legal definition, you know, there is a legal definition to genocide too. That is, that is an, interna an internationally understood crime. Okay, we've had many genocides around the world. Not all of them look the same, right? Today's, today's Yom HaShoah. In, in Europe, genocide looked very different than it did in Rwanda. It looked very different than it did in Cambodia. It looked very different than it did in many other places around the world. Nonetheless, they all fit within the framework of this definition. I think, I think what, we, what we have there is, fits within this definition. But, you know, as Peter said, whatever we call it, the reality is we have to do something about it. We can't, we can't, we can't let it stand. We, we all know what we're talking about, whether we like that term or not. And what it is is unacceptable. That, and that's something that has to change. Good, that helps bring out some of the different you know, points of view here. That was, I thought that was helpful. All right, so uh, do you all three agree that we have to do something about that? And would that we include colleges like Pitzer College? And if so, what actions do you recommend that colleges or individuals take? And I don't know, but Alex, we could start with you. Um, I think that uh, colleges have a responsibility to take action. Um, 
when I was thinking about this question, I, it brought me back to um, some of the language that was used in the judgment for Brown v. Board of Education, which um, ended segregation in the United States. And in that judgment, they said that education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. It's the very foundation of good citizenship. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values, in preparing him for later professional training, and helping him adjust normally to his environment. So if we want to normalize oppression, then let's not do anything about it. If we want our students to become citizens, global citizens, um, then we need to do something about the conflict. Um, I think that if we want to teach our students the cultural values that we talk about all the time in the United States but fail to act on, then we need to start taking a stand. Um, now, there's a ton of different ways that colleges can um, become involved in the conflict. And by involved, I mean not like supporting the conflict, but doing something about it. Um, one of the areas that I think that there is a lot of room for colleges to get involved in, and students in particular, is campus speech, campus speech codes. Um, in the sense that campus speech codes that regulate hate speech on campus is frequently used to censor um, more of the leftist positions on campus and minority students in particular. And campus speech codes were created in an, in an attempt to create a balance on campus between this marketplace of ideas and also respecting each other and having tolerance for one another and recognizing that hate speech has a huge impact on students. And what I've seen, at least on my college campus, is that frequently campus speech codes and codes against protesting and disrupting the education of fellow students are only deployed against um, students who are advocating for a mo more pro-Palestinian platform. And I think that's problematic. If schools are gonna be regulating the speech of students, then we need to be regulating everyone or regulating no one. We ha need to have a more balanced regulation, especially since we already have this inequity that exists with regards to speech acts, right? Who gets to talk in America is not an equal opportunity um, kind of game. And so we have to understand that on campuses, one way campuses can get involved is just by making sure their students have the equal right to speak. Um, now, another way that campuses can get involved is education. And I am a little biased because that's what I do. Um, but education, you know, if we think about some of the goals of the Palestinian movement, um, in particular, the goal of eliminating discrimination against Palestinian is Israelis, a lot of people don't know about this. They don't know about the discrimination that Palestinian Israelis face. And so education becomes sort of a key tool to getting folks to just be aware of what's going on. And there's some really cool ways that we can actually engage in education. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about my experience during the Olive Tree Initiative. It's an experiential learning program. We take students, we do a 30-week course on the history of the conflict. And then we take students to DC, to New York. They meet with politicians, uh, former ambassadors who work on these issues. And then they go to Jordan, they go to Israel, they go to the West Bank for three weeks. And they meet with everybody from a variety of perspectives. And the goal is to destabilize students' understandings of what's going on, right? And provide students with a first-hand understanding of the conflict, not just their own first-hand understanding, but talking to people who have a first-hand understanding. And so that's one way that campuses can get involved. Now, if campuses decide to divest and boycott, that's gonna ch change some of the opportunities that are available education-wise. But I, doesn't, I don't think it closes off those opportunities. It means we need to become more creative in how we educate students about the conflict. Um, it means, you know, say the UC Irvine decides to divest and we no longer are welcome in Israel to bring our students, then we have to come up with other ways to engage with those communities locally, right? Um, and then the last thing is, and we can talk more about this, is I think that, yeah, individual students can engage in BDS and boycott and divest. They can't sanction, but they can hope. Um, but it's institutions like campuses that actually have the power, right? To be able to boycott something means you're a consumer that has economic power. And um, 
while most of us are consumers, our economic power is different across the board. And so it's institutions that really make a difference. So I think at the institutional level, uh, divesting is one of the best ways colleges can get involved. So um, I, I fully support boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, and um, before I, I get into why I think that's the, the right way to go, I, I would like to start out by saying, if I could choose you know, any, any way to go about it, that wouldn't be my first choice. Um, and the reason for that is because it is not really the quickest way to achieve justice. It is not the quickest way to change Israeli behavior. The quickest way to change Israeli behavior is if the international system, and the United States in particular, lived up to its own obligations to enforce international law. That is not happening. That is not happening primarily because the United States insists that it does not happen. On over 40 occasions, the United States has been the single solitary veto at the United Nations on resolutions demanding changes in Israeli behavior at the United Nations Security Council. The only no vote, including uh, all of its Western European allies uh, voting in support of these resolutions. The United States has been obstructionist in the path of the international community uh, in, in, in getting involved. If the international state system is going to uh, abdicate its responsibility to enforce international law, to demand accountability, then what is left is for international civil society to take a stand. That is why the movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions is not my first option. It's the last option remaining. And that's why it's so important. It's not, it's not something that I would start out with. But until we see change at that level, and the way we can create change at that level is by starting to create change at this level. We will get there eventually. We're, we're, not, we're not dreaming about the S. There, there will be an S one day, right? There was no S, there was no sanctions on South Africa until someone said, you know what? Damn it, we're gonna change this. And long before there was a veto-proof majority in Congress for comprehensive sanctions on South Africa, there were two lonely congressmen that attached their name to a resolution in the early 1970s demanding the same thing, two. It took a long time to build that support, and it started because there was a civil society effort around the world to support it. So it all depends on the kind of choices that we make. And again, we are already involved. We're involved in the wrong way, right? So our choices are get involved in the right way or stop being involved in the wrong way, okay? Either of those would make me a lot happier than the way that we are involved today. Um, thanks. So I just wanted to just first just echo a couple of things that Alex said because I thought they were really important. Um, the first is that I think the um, the importance of seeing um, uh, both Israel and Palestine for oneself, and seeing people who live uh, uh, um, going beyond the discourse here and actually being able to see for oneself is extraordinarily important. And so I think the work that you do, Alex, is really, really invaluable. And um, um, I think one of the big problems in the, um, both in the American Jewish community and among American politicians is the kind of a, a very, very frequent visiting of Israel, but actually very rarely actually encountering Palestinians, which creates a kind of a, an, a certain kind of intimate understanding with a certain reality, but absolutely no understanding of another, of another reality. And so I think that one of the things that I would love to see happen would be for, you know, programs not only to be taking college students to, to both, to, um, to both sides of the green line and, and um, to Jews and Palestinians living in all kinds of different environments, but actually if American politicians actually were to have those experiences too, I think it would actually be quite uh, powerful. And I think just anecdotally the experience actually among those American politicians who actually have been to the West Bank and seen Palestinian life under Israeli military control actually has been quite uh, powerful for those members of Congress. Um, I also um, think that the, free, that the free speech questions are really important, and I think that the, um, and I agree that the, in an effort to stop criticism of Israel, I think there have been very, very, very disturbing and heavy-handed 
efforts to silence pal pro-Palestinian free speech, including efforts to not allow Students for Justice in Palestine groups to form organizations. And it is enormously frustrating to me to see um, some uh, people uh, in the media, some of whom I know, who um, are outraged, I think sometimes rightly outraged, about the things that happen to conservative speakers like Charles Murray or whoever on campus, and yet, and speak a lot about free speech on campus, and yet somehow are completely blind to that issue. On the other hand, I would also say, um, I think it's also important that if a group of conservative students on a college campus want to invite Alan Dershowitz or whoever else, Benjamin Netanyahu, to come and speak on their campus, they have the right to that for that person to be able to come and speak. They certainly don't have the right for that person to not have difficult questions asked of them, but they have the right to have that person speak, just like SJP should have the right to bring in Omar Margudi and have that person be able to be, finish their speech without being interrupted and certainly without the, the threat of violence. So um, I think that it's important that we have people who are willing to stand up on, for, on, for, on both sides of that question. I'm not making an argument about which one is more of a menace, but I think that it's, it's important on both sides. Um, uh, I, I have, a, um, I have a fair amount to say about BDS, but I suspect that since we'll probably continue on with that subject, and I've spoken already a bit just on the college campus point, I'll, I'll leave it and, and, and return to it as we, as we go forward. Okay, well that actually is our very next question. So, <laughs> okay, so you're getting your opportunity right away. Okay. okay, so what I'd really like, there are many different approaches to boycotts and divestment. And I wonder if you could, if all of you could talk about the differences among them and your view of different approaches, different ways of going about the divestment or boycotts. And I guess as uh, you pointed out, sanctions maybe are not so much what we're talking about typically in a college situation but boycotts and divestment, yeah. So actually, since you sure. hold off, why, okay. why, don't, why don't we just go back this way? Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so I would say my guiding principle in thinking about this is that I um, would support any form of pressure on the Israeli government to change its policies, which is A, nonviolent, and B, respects the legitimacy of both Jewish and Palestinian nationalism, um, um, which is to say, respects the, the, the existence of a Jewish state. Um, um, uh, and I think that, um, th so that means that I support um, uh, boycotting products from the West Bank, um, uh, which is an area because uh, Palestinians are held without citizenship in the West Bank. I support um, resolutions at the United Nations. I support American diplomatic pressure. I even support um, uh, conditioning, in certain ways, conditioning American military aid to Israel. On, um, on an end to its settlement subsidies and an Israeli support for, um, uh, for a Palestinian state along the green, uh, you know, a kind of Clinton parameters or Arab League initiative kind of vision of of an of end to the conflict. Um, the reason I don't support, now the BDS movement has different campaigns that, that, that function in different particular ways that one might have to look at the specifics. But the reason I don't support it in general as a call is because it denies the existence of any important distinction between the part of Israel where Palestinians have citizenship and the right to vote, and and the part of, and the territories under Israeli control where Palestinians don't, and I think those distinctions matter, um, uh, and and it's and also because it does not re, re, it does not grant any legitimacy to the no, notion of Jewish self determination, and I see this as a struggle between two national movements and um, that will be best solved by recognizing the legitimacy of both national movements. Not a carte blanche to both national movements, certainly not a carte blanche to, to, uh, to Israel to, to deny Palestinians basic rights, nor for that matter a carte blanche to Islamic Jihad or Hamas to create a Palestinian uh, territory in which Jews would lack basic rights. But Basically, I believe in the value of nationalism. I believe that binational states are, have not been very effective, and I believe in trying to balance liberalism, liberal democracy, with nationalism. There is a tension within Zionism, we'll talk about this, there's a tension between the notion of Zionism as a movement based on the idea of representing and protecting the Jewish people and liberal democracy, given that liberal democracy is about equal rights for all people. But I would, but I would argue there is, that, there is also a tension in Palestinian nationalism 
nationalism, between the, the desire to represent and protect Palestinians, who if you look at Palestinian documents, you see references to an Arab nation, you see references to Islamic law, and those documents also talk about liberal democracy and equal rights, which is to say these two nationalist movements both have these tensions within them. And I believe that uh, the BDS movement, because it does not, ref rec does not accept any legitimacy for the notion of Jewish self-determination, ultimately does not point towards the end goal that I think will be best the best way to solve this, this problem. So that's why I'm not a supporter of BDS, even though I do support boycotting products from the West Bank. Um, so, I, the, the BDS movement focuses on rights, uh, not on nationalism, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why um, Peter's unable to find the sort of commitments to Israeli nationalism in there, um, because that's, that's not what it's about. It's focused on the rights of individuals, in this case, the rights of individuals that are being denied, which are the rights of Palestinians. Um, and uh, it's, it's just perhaps an oversight, but it is, it is incorrect to say that there is no distinction in the BDS call between Palestinians uh, in the West Bank and Gaza and, and Palestinian citizens of Israel. In fact, the, the three core uh, demands of the BDS call are an end to the occupation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip in East Jerusalem, a right for Palestinian refugees to return in accordance with international law, and a right for uh, equality to Palestinian citizens of Israel, okay? Not Palestinian citizens of Lebanon or Syria or China or anywhere else, Israel, okay? There, there is a clear understanding that there are different groups here and there is an Israeli state. Um, and, and it is the Israeli state whose behavior we are aiming to change. Uh, not, not the behavior of individual Israelis, but the policies of the Israeli state. And while I agree with Peter very much that the settlements are a problem, that the occupation is a problem, uh, and there are also other problems that extend beyond the settlements and the occupation, including the rights of refugees being denied and the denial of equality to Palestinian citizens of Israel outside of the occupied territories. The reality is all of those policies are formulated by a state, a singular state, led by a singular government, which is the government of the state of Israel. That is the entity whose calculations have to change. That is the entity that has to look at the situation and say it's becoming too costly to continue these policies, so we have to change them. So that is the entity that must be the target of these tactics. Right? Along with anyone else who is profiteering from the situation. So I support not just a, uh, you know, a boycott of products that are coming from the settlements, but also any boycott and divestment efforts that target the Israeli state, because that's, that's the address where the message has to be sent. Okay? The, the message is not going to be sent to the settlements, because it's not the settlements, the, the people in the settlements, who are deciding that the settlements are going to be built. It's not the people in the settlements who are deciding to allocate millions upon millions of dollars to continue expanding, expropriating, sending the military out there, building infrastructure. No, it's the, it's the Israeli government. That has to be the target uh, of, of our efforts. So I agree with Yusuf that I think it's important that we keep the goals, the explicit three goals of the BDS movement in mind when we talk about BDS, whether it's in America, on college campuses, or what have you. Um, I've seen that there's been a tendency over time for a lot of organizations that stand in solidarity with the Palestinian cause to transform BDS from a strategy and a means to an actual goal in and of itself. And so um, what we see is uh, the adoption of resolutions featuring language of BDS that actually don't give any thought to 
the goals of ending the occupation, ensuring the right of return, improving equality um, among Palestinian Israelis. And so I think that can be problematic because then we have this lack of almost local ownership over a movement that's intended and that's, that's really on behalf of the Palestinian people, articulated by folks from all areas of Palestinian life. So, um, you know, some resolutions don't even mention the goals of BDS at all. And so I think that if we're going to be engaging in BDS in the United States um, and engaging in solidarity movements, we have to be really cognizant of the movements that we're trying to stand in solidarity with, okay? Um, now, I think that the boycott strategy is best when it, and divestment strategy is best when it um, targets corporations that directly enable the continuation of the occupation. So I think it's easiest to first start with talking with investors, for example, about um, corporate responsibility and how investing in particular corporations has a direct impact on the oppression of Palestinians. Um, and so, for example, you know, G4S is that transnational security corporation that provides Israel with um, security systems for the Israeli prison authority. And the Israeli prison authority is often used to police and uh, detain Palestinians, including children. And so putting pressure on this corporation in particular, you could see the clear direct impact that it would have on continuing the occupation. So I think that... Um, that's important to keep in mind when we talking, we're talking about BDS. Um, I think, like I said, consumer boycotts are great, but um, individuals can only make so much of a difference. And so the real power of divestment, in particular, lies with institutions. Um, so I think that divesting from particular corporations that maybe work to support teacher funds, pensions, um, is a good start. Um, universities have tremendous spending power and tremendous weight. You know, the University of California, for example, is one of the largest university systems in the world. Are you telling me that divestment on behalf of UCs isn't going to make a difference? Maybe it won't, because at the end of the day, Israel does have this economic um, superiority that we don't see in South Africa. South Africa was just industrializing when BDS was starting to happen. And so I, I do wonder just... It's gonna take a long time, like Yusuf said. It's gonna be part of a multi-decade campaign. Um, and so we have to be realistic about that as well, but also count our successes where they come. Uh, we're starting to get to the time where I said uh, it would be time for your questions. There is, uh, uh, There are just two more things, though, that I would like to ask. One is an important issue of the campus climate. Uh, here at the Claremont Colleges, and, and as at many colleges around the country, the campus climate around Israel and Palestine is fraught. Uh, you've all already addressed that when talking about speech codes. Um, but it's, it's, it's sometimes it's student on student, as well as having to do with outside speakers as well. We know that students and faculty who are critical of Israeli policies and practices are accused of being anti-Semitic, and this accusation conflates anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism in deeply problematic ways. And the opposite happens as well. Jewish students are assumed to support Israel's policy, policies when there is no necessary connection between their religion and their political views. Um, how, in addition to, uh, and we've got uh, issues within, uh, you know, the colleges, student on student, as well as outside groups targeting students for their views. Um, uh, so you've, you've talked about speech codes, but what else could colleges think about in terms of protecting students and members, other members of the colleges, faculty, staff, uh, protecting them to foster more respectful forms of dealing with uh, talk about this issue, if any of you have thoughts about that. I mean, I, you know, you kind of, one of the things that you mentioned is this conflation between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, and I think it, it's, it's very important for people to understand that um, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are not the same thing. Um, anti-Semitism should not be tolerated, bigotry in any form should not be tolerated, uh, but at the same time, we cannot allow uh, 
smear campaigns and false accusations of uh, bigotry and anti-Semitism to prevent criticism of Israel or criticism of Zionism, um, w which is an ideology that is you know, perfectly up for legitimate criticism as is any other uh, ideology. Uh, and I, I think it's very important for campuses to make clear that that is the case. And there's actually a very significant effort underway by many pro-Israel organizations that are attempting to make it harder and harder uh, to see where that difference is, and in fact try to write into law uh, definitions of anti-Semitism that include types of criticism of, of, of Israel. Uh, and you know, depending on how things work out in the Senate over the next couple of weeks, uh, the new head of the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Education uh, may be one uh, of the individuals uh, who has been at the head of these campaigns around the country to try to institute um, uh, codes into uh, laws on education about conflating uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. So I think this is one of the places where campuses can really take a clear stand and say that you know, criticism of Israel is permissible and nobody should be uh, you know, smeared as a bigot or, or, or as an anti-Semite for having legitimate criticism of Israel. I think that um, in order to ensure that campuses take this stand on the conflation between anti-Zionism and um, anti-Semitism, it's important that we educate people about what the differences are. Um, and that means, how do we educate people on s such a topic, right? It, it can become quite a charged conversation. And so one of the ways that I've tried to have these kinds of conversations on campus is um, first targeting what I call um, the low-hanging fruits. So students that already buy into the idea of wanting to hear somebody else's perspective. Right? So that's the first place that you start, is having those students engaged in a conversation. Um, and I always invite students into my classes that it's not a safe space, it's a brave space. Right? It's a space in which we're all agreeing to be uncomfortable, but to listen to other people's perspectives. So targeting the low-hanging fruit, it's a conscious decision in the sense that we're empowering these students as agents of change, in the sense that these students, after having a successful conversation with folks about what the difference is between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, and how sometimes anti-Zionism can be anti-Semitic, but it's not always, is then they go take these conversations that they have and they bring them back to their own communities. They talk to their dorm mate about it. They talk to their mom about it. They talk to um, anybody that's willing to listen. And this is some ways that this information can filter out on campus. Um, because I think just taking a stance and saying anti-Semitism is, or anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-Semitism leaves people wondering why. And I think we need to fill in the gap as, as educators. Um, we need to provide students with the tools to assess, is this anti-Zionist statement anti-Semitic or not? Um, and, uh, and provide students with the critical tools that they can make these judgments and not just accept that it is on its own. I, mean, I, I agree um, very much. I would say, I think that um, part of the challenge is, is, is right to explain why um, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are conceptually different, right? Which starts with an understanding of Zionism as itself, actually, a, originally a rebellion against tr traditional Jewish interpretations of the Talmud, which basic, which which were hot, which which said there could not be a, a recreation of Jewish sovereignty until Messianic times. So it's just kind of understanding the history of Zionism as a very particular movement that emerged in a particular context in the 19th century, which was not a natural, which was not the inevitable or natural outgrowth of, of Jewish religious practice, for instance. Um, uh, and, and, um, and, and re so recognizing that there has always been in the, among Jews, uh, uh, historically, a very, very, since the 19th century, very, very robust and passionate debate about Zionism. Um, but I also think it's important, even as we try to counter those people, and I totally agree with what Yusuf and Alex said, who, who deny the possibility of, of being an anti, who, who deny the possibility that you can be an anti-Zionist without being an anti-Semite, to whom I would say, have you ever met the Satmarebi? I mean, there, there are there are large 
uh, Haredi communities in the United States, you know, around the world that have always been anti-Zionist, and we would never suggest that they're anti-Semitic. That's that that. Um, um, but I also think it's important for people to understand why the why the a Zionist consensus was created amongst most the large majority of Jewish populations in the world over a very fairly short period of time. I mean, there was a very very robust, divisive debate about Zionism. Um, around the world um, in the early 20th century. And by the middle of the 20th century, that debate, again, with some notable exceptions, was largely, had largely ended. And the reason it, it ended primarily was the Holocaust. I mean, American Jews had, had all kinds of conceptual problems with Zionism. Again, from Orthodox Jews who believed that it violated the, the, the Talmud to Reform Jews who believed that Jews were a faith but not a, a, a nation, the reform movement famously said in the 19th century, America is our Zion. Um, um, and yet it was the, if you want to understand um, American Jewish politics and American Jewish identity, um, uh, and you have to understand that, that, that American Jews, did, that Jews around the world didn't become Zionists uh, um, uh, just by happenstance, right? What made, the Amer what made American Jews overwhelmingly Zionist was the experience of seeing the destruction of European Jewry and the fact that the countries, the nations of the world would not, allow, would not give refuge to Jews, which for many people who had all kinds of conceptual, theological, philosophical, ideological problems with Zionism seemed a pretty powerful argument for the idea that there should be a Jewish state so that Jews would have somewhere to go. Now, I'm not arguing that the, there, there are not critiques of that argument, but you have to understand that if you want to understand why Zionism has become so central to Jewish identity in the United States and around the world if you're going to have a productive conversation. Um, and um, I think the last point I would make is that I think that um, you can't understand how this debate plays itself out in the United States without recognizing that most American Jews, not all American Jews, but most American Jews are considered white, right? Which means they enjoy, uh, and, and, um, and most Palestinians uh, in America are not considered white, right? And since, and, and in America, that makes a really big difference. Um, and so I think one of the challenges in this conversation is for white Jews, uh, um, uh, which are the vast majority of American Jews, to recognize that they enjoy a privilege that actually exists, right? Even though they may not necessarily feel it given their own family histories and, fa and identity, is for them to realize that that actually does exist and it does shape the way they interact with these political conversations. But also for non-Jews and people struggling for the Palestinian cause to recognize that um, that 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 um, being that be, Jews are not simply another group of white people. They are a group with a very, very, very distinctive, deep history of persecution, and not only a persecution that, that you know, and not only a persecution that happened in 1903 in the Ukraine, but as we're seeing today, a persecution that, for whatever strange set of reasons, has proved remarkably resilient over time and in different places, and indeed that we are seeing an upsurge of even today in ways that. I probably wouldn't have really thought possible a few years ago. So I think it's important for, the, for people, for people uh, to recognize that even as they see white Jews as a privileged group, which in many ways they are, to recognize that they're also a very, very distinctive group that has, that, that, that has been subjected to threats and indeed can still be subjected to threats and that it's important to take that to account. I just want to ask one last question, and this is for Peter Barnard only. Uh, you are on Open Hillel's academic council. Uh, that here at the Claremont Colleges, through our chaplaincy, we're in partnership with Hillel International. Can you speak to Open Hillel's position as regards Hillel International? Um, yeah, and I think it, you know, it goes to the kind of the work that Alex does. Um, the, the problem is that Hillel has a set of guidelines that, that define who Hillel can sponsor events with, who, who, um, who can come and speak in Hillel functions, that basically um, severely limit the debate about Israel that you can have in that space. So for instance, it really would make, uh, uh, an, make it impossible for an anti-Zionist really to speak at a Hillel event, or for someone who supports BDS, for instance. Um, and um, 
I think that's a terrible mistake, and that's why I believe in the idea of Open Hill. I think hills are very, very important institutions for, for, for the cultivation of Jewish identity, but um, institutions that are trying to cultivate Jewish identity, something which is I think about a lot, um, should not be saying that you are only welcome in this space, in this Jewish space, if you have a certain perspective on, um, on, is on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or even Zionism itself. What I would like to say, again, there is a very, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it says um, uh, uh, th there is a, uh, a very rich Jewish tradition of learning from others. And I believe that you can't understand, you, there's absolutely no way you can understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict unless you are reading and listening to Palestinians. And the Hillel Guidelines essentially makes that impossible. Um, uh, and, and so uh, I, that's why I believe in the movement that Open Hillel is creating, because I think it's really important to have Jewish spaces in which people can have arguments about Jewish identity, in which Zionism can itself be on the table, as indeed it has been historically in periods and in uh, th uh, in various ways throughout throughout the last you know 150 years of Jewish history. Thank you. And with that, we'll now turn to the last part of our program. Uh, we have a half hour for your questions. We've got uh, Bill Anthes back there with a microphone, and Renan uh, Green is going to have a microphone. Uh, let's see. Let's start. We've got a question over there. Uh, over Bill, here, yes. Yeah, we're, we're, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Chisanga, and my question is, you talked about the power imbalance, and um, when a disempowered group, the only way they can sort of fight back is through terrorism. So I wanted to ask, do you think that terrorism from the Palestinian nationalist group is justified? So uh, I, I, I don't think the only way to fight back is through terrorism. I think there are many different ways to fight back. And I think, you know, um, in the conversation that we had, we talked about nonviolence. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about nonviolence in the American context, right, we have a certain frame of reference here for what that means. We have certain examples that we draw immediately to mind. Um, but resistance is, what is resistance? Resistance is pushing back against something that's pushing on you, right? Uh, and so the form that that take, takes is often conditioned by the form of the pressure on you, right? Um, and so it can take different shapes in, in different places and at different times. Um, I think the vast majority of Palestinian resistance that we see is nonviolent resistance. We don't always recognize it for what it is. When you understand that a society is under military occupation and often under constant pressure to leave their land, and nonetheless they remain steadfast there, living every day is a form of nonviolent resistance under those conditions, okay? Um, so I think there are many, many different ways that resistance can play itself out. I'm a supporter of nonviolent economic action. That's the reason I'm here to talk to you about BDS. That's the reason why I dedicate my work to it, because I think that not only is it a, a moral way uh, to resist, it's also strategically an effective uh, way to do so, and I don't support, obviously, any kind of criminal acts. If I could just say two seconds, I would just say, I think that there's, there's an equal, the, the, at the same time that I would condemn Palestinian acts of violence, I also think it's very important to, as Yusuf was saying, it's the, the, the media portrayal of, Pal of the Palestinian movement would have you believe that it's a movement that is overwhelmingly characterized by violence. And I think that, um, so, um, and, and so I think that's part of the problem. So you often hear, kind of, you know, to my mind, very frustratingly, people say, and you hear this in the American Jewish community, if only the Palestinians would turn to nonviolence then, you know, and they would find their Gandhis, then, um, you know, then everything would be great. And, and, and part of the reason people say that is because actually Palestinian nonviolence doesn't often garner the attention that it deserves. My name is Alan Wagner. I have two questions you can choose to answer. Both or just one. I'll make them quick. 
One, there was a call for a Jewish state. The founders of this country with huge blind spots recognized you cannot have ethno-religious privilege and put in safeguards against having that. It's rising today. My t-shirt says they warned us about this in Hebrew school, which is normal people asserting ethno-religious privilege. Today we see in Israel normal people asserting ethno-religious privilege. How can you have a Jewish, a Jewish state? We're built on ethno-religious privilege that does not give rise to the behavior we see today, here, and have seen consistently in Israel. Second question, how can universities promote research that policymakers can rely on that tells the truth as opposed to the alternate universe that policymakers are being fed and which they constantly spout to us? In, in terms of the research um, question, I mean, we can make, we can promote that kind of research, but we can't make policymakers read it. Um, and that's the sad truth about being an academic, is nobody reads your shit. Um, <laughs> But that being said, I think, I mean, we need to start looking at um, like these think tanks that policymakers are actually drawing their research from. And we need to start questioning sort of the role that think tanks play um, in producing that kind of research. And then um, I also think in terms of just, if I wanna answer as a researcher, I think we need to stop living in our ivory tower and we need to start engaging in research that actually engages with the folks that we're studying. Um, that means being problem driven, not method driven, not theory driven. We need to um, identify particular problems in social life and actually work to expose what those problems are and interrogate them and figure out solutions rather than necessarily direct our research based on what interests me today. You know, I think research is a political activity. It's a political decision to choose to research one thing over another. And I think that the moment we start thinking of it as a neutral activity is the moment we lose the power as researchers to maybe actually have an impact on the world. Uh, I guess I would just, just say briefly in, in response to your first question. Um, I, it's, a, it's important to remember that there are many, many countries around the world um, that, for instance, they have crosses on their flags. Many countries around the world that we would consider democracies in Europe, for instance, Greece, Germany, Poland, um, that have preferential immigration policies for a certain ethnic group. Now, um, and indeed, I think if you look at the documents uh, um, that, that we've seen for the creation of a Palestinian state, you see documents that also talk about a privileged special role for Arabs and Muslims in that state. Now, um, uh, now th then, that is certainly not um, kind of carte blanche for, um, for, the, for the denial of basic rights of, 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 of other groups. In fact, my, the vision I have of a Jewish state, which was supported by international law, right? There's a right under international law and the right of return. There's also a right under international law for a Jewish state, uh, would be a much, much more minimal definition of, a Jew, of, of, of what Jewish statehood means to, than, than it exists in Israel today, just as I would hope that the Palestinian definition would also be minimal enough to allow for, um, for, for, for true equality and dignity for non-Arabs and non-Muslims in a Palestinian state. But I do believe that it is important to have a state around the world that has a special responsibility for the protection of Jewish life, um, uh, uh, given, um, given the long experience of Jewish history. Now, I, would I feel that way if I were a Palestinian or if I weren't, if I weren't Jewish? Perhaps not, um, uh, but I'm not, I'm not a universal human being, I'm a Jew. Uh, and just as I have special obligations to my family, I have special obligations to my people. Um, and uh, I believe that in a post-Holocaust world, the, um, the, the uh, one state in the world that has a special obligation to the protection of Jewish life is important. Um, now, beyond that, there, there are f profound fundamental changes that I would wanna see in the very nature of Israeli statehood, but that to me is important. Just one, one clarifying point on this. I think, uh, and I'm glad that you asked your, your question. Um, I, 
I don't think the issue with, with Zionism is just that it's ethnic nationalism, right? That's not, that, that's not the only issue here. There are other forms of ethnic nationalism. Oftentimes they rear their ugly head into things that become fascism, and we all, we all know what that, that looks like. And I know there's many people who are worried that that may be what we're starting to see here in the United States uh, as well, hopefully not. Um, the, the, the issue with, with Zionism as ethnic nationalism is not just that a certain percentage of a, a, a demographic group within a particular space decided to declare a state for, for them, to privilege them. It's that it was done at the expense of another people who were already in that space, which makes it fundamentally different. And it makes the, um, uh, the, 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 the path forward as a result of that very, very different uh, as well. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Actually, first of all, I can see non-balance of power there in the panel is some supporting this side, different side. My name is Shukriya and I'm coming from the Middle East, I'm Muslim, so I I'm ju just mentioned that before to make my comment about your argument. First, I wanna say the, the Palestine and Israel's conflict after the Cold War has become the not nationalist, it's become the religious conflict more than the nationalist. It is what we see in the in the history background of that before the Cold War and after the Cold War, these two nations conflict. And Alexander said that Palestinian people, they they are alone, they don't have anyone there. But as a person that they have a PhD research on the Middle East, they are not alone. They have some people that are supporting them, but I'm in the wrong way. What the wrong way, for example, you have in the Middle East, Iranian and Turkish and most of the Arab country, they support in Palestine. But that the reality, they don't support Palestine. They're supporting their own interests in the region. And they're leading the Palestinian people in the wrong direction. How, for example, if you look at the Turkey's aggressive behavior in the Middle East, when they have some problem with the different, the West countries, they put in the Palestinians and the Israelis issue on the table and they say, okay, we supporting the Palestinians, you supporting the Israel. And the same in the Iran and other country in the region. So I believe that, I just wanna know your comments too. I believe if we leave these two nations alone and let them to talk, peace talk between these two nations will be the resolution for these two. And uh, I don't, I wanna know about your comment about the one state and two state with, for these two nations as well and how you will see this resolution. Because what we hear from you guys is just talking about the, what happened as the violence is going on in the Palestine, what, what Israel doing against the Palestinian people. It is what all of us, we know what's going on there. We didn't hear the solution for that one. Actually, I want to mention my last comment about the media that Peter is, the, I'm sure he's the, um, uh, very well known about the journalists and the media. Uh, in the West, we have uh, media that just talking about the reaction. They're not talking about the action. For example, what happened in the, in the most of the uh, Gaza, uh, what Hamas, they, they attack Israel from the, from the schools and from the hospital. In the reaction, Israel attacked this school and this hospital. But what we saw in the West media, they just talk about the Israel's reaction against the Palestinian, but they didn't say why Israel took this reaction, why Israel attacked this uh, hospital and school. They didn't say because Hamas attacked this from this area. So as the mm, professional in the media, I just want to know your comment about, okay, in this case, that media in the West working against the, the Israel most of the time, supporting Israel, Palestine, that I don't believe that they care about the Palestinian people. They care about their own interests, as I said, for the many reasons. And the solution for these two nations to, to talk in the peace and live together in the peace. Thank you. Uh, so there was a lot there. I'm going to try to respond to, to some of it. Um, uh, as, as far as the way that states in, throughout the region uh, uh, manipulate uh, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian issue for their own politics, uh, it's, it, that's, that's not particularly remarkable, right? Every state has their own interests. I think if that speaks to anything, it speaks to the, the importance of this issue throughout the Arab and Muslim world because the publics still care very much uh, 
about this issue, even if their governments might be manipulating it for their own cynical purposes. Um, as far as the solution, you, know, you suggested, well, you know, to leave these people alone to talk and to sort out their problems. The, 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 the problem is, and, and, and we've, we've discussed it here, is the Im imbalance of power. If you, know, you leave a, a, a seven foot, 400 pound man in the room with a four foot, 100 pound weakling and leave them alone to sort out their problems, we know how that's gonna be sorted out, right? And it's not gonna be sorted out in an equitable way. It's going to be sorted out in a way that that power decides it's going to happen. So the, the the question that we have here is what role can we play in, of course, at the end of the day, Israelis and Palestinians have to come to an agreement together for something. But we're playing a role in creating the conditions that make it impossible for any sort of just solution to happen by empowering one side significantly over the other, okay? Um, and. Uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it there because I know we, we want to get to other stuff as well. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Um, I have um, I have two questions, but you can choose to answer whichever one you want. Um, so the first one is. Uh, Mr. Bynar, you you in like the very first thing you said, you mentioned that um, there was this, there are two nationalisms kind of you know in tension with each other, and you said the Palestinian nationalism started with the Balfour Declaration. Declaration, um, but I would like to ask you how you can reconcile that with the f the fact that there was um, in 1915 the Hossein McMahon uh, correspondence, and the fact that Arabs have been um, wanting nationalism for quite some time, it's not a new concept, um, and it's not something that started um, with just the Balfour Declaration. And then the second question is, in terms of campus uh, activism, um, there is the connection between police officers and Israel in the sense that the Ferguson uh, police station trained with Israel, and the re reaction um, with the protests there were largely student-based, and how can we tie together these um, these organizations that have um, similar problems and, and issues institutionally and systemically um, in a cohesive and productive way. For example, Black Lives Matter uh, talking about Palestine in their um, in their um, their platform um, and how we can we can really enact that in a productive way. I'll just say on the first. I, I don't think I mentioned the Balfour direction. The, the 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 point I was. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that there was not pre-mandate um, uh, connections uh, and affinities between uh, people who lived in the part of the Ottoman Empire, which is now Israel slash Palestine. But I think that Palestinian nationalism, as I understand it, like many kind of uh, like many nationalisms that emerged in Africa and the Middle East. And in, in, in Asia, partly emerged because colonial powers drew the boundary in a certain way, right? So why did Nigerian nationalism emerge, right? Because colonial powers drew a, a territory called Nigeria, and then people who wanted to, who were fighting against Britain, who wanted to create, who wanted to, who wanted independence, and wanted uh, basically then created a Nigerian national identity as the vehicle for struggling for against this colonial. So I think I think Palestinian nationalism, in, in that way at least, is very is 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 similar to many others, right? Right, which is why why when people, sometimes people say, well, you know, there were never any Palestinians, you know, I don't know, X number of years ago. I, I always say, well, how many Kenyans were there? I mean, how, how many Indonesians were there? I mean, this is this is the kind of the way modern nationalism works. Um, so anyway, that was the only point I was making. I'll, I'll leave the second for for other folks. Um, so I think that your second question hits on an interesting point is solidarity between Black Lives Matter movement and the Palestinian struggle. And that's something that's been going on for years. It's not a new thing with Black Lives Matter. Um, and I see it a lot on college campuses. That's one way that campuses can get involved is sort of um, finding solidarity between their black student union and SJP or other organizations. Um, now... One thing I have noticed in these solidarity efforts is that they tend to focus on too much. So Black Lives Matter 
Um, and SJP having like 70 different chants in one protest that cover the entire globe dilutes the message, if that makes sense. And so I think it's important to, when you're engaging in solidarity politics, that you have to really be cognizant of who your audience is and also who you're in solidarity with, right? Because they should be taking the lead. Now, I do think there's something to be said about the relationship between the military and the police and the oppression of people of color. And so if we wanna look at, it, it's kind of hard to disentangle the military and the police um, in the sense that the police are becoming increasingly militarized, right? So that's one area that we can start. Finally, I just think that if there's solidarity not just between Black Lives Matter towards the Palestinian movement, but the Palestinian movement towards Black Lives Matter, we can also see some changes happen as well. But I don't necessarily see that, and that's not necessarily surprising because um, I think the institutional conditions, the operative conditions that these two movements operate in are very different. And not everybody has the capacity for um, mutual solidarity movements. That's not to say that there aren't any, but I think that um, we have to recognize that there's different resources available to Black Lives Matter as there are to the Palestinian movement. Just add to that a little bit. On, on the question of the, the police exchanges, if people are not familiar with um, what this issue is here, um, there are trips set up, right, for police forces from specific municipalities to go to Israel to train with uh, Israeli police and counterterrorism units, okay, uh, and exchange ideas about how to go about their work, right? And the idea is that this is supposed to improve right, the, the uh, ability of the, of the units to, to function. Um, and I, I would argue that this is not only about solidarity. Obviously, there are a lot of solidarity aspects to this, particularly with what African Americans especially deal with when it comes to police brutality and racial profiling here in the United States. But beyond that, it's also a issue of direct concern for Arabs and Muslims in this country when it comes to the exchange of tactics related to counterterrorism policing, right? So it's beyond that as well. And I would, you know, I, for me, this is very simple that these are, these are things that need to, to end. It's, uh, you know, we, we have a robust debate in this country already about the need for greater police accountability, right? And we already believe that racial profiling is wrong. And in many municipalities, there are actually laws on the books already making clear that police training should not include racial profiling as a policing tactic, right? And yet, there are these police exchanges set up for metropolitan police departments to train and learn from units in a foreign country that unabashedly use racial profiling as a policing tactic, okay? I think there's a big problem with that, and that's a very easy thing to say, you know, we probably shouldn't be doing that anymore. And, and just to be clear, not just because it's Israel, but in any situation like that, I don't know how many there are, but if we're sending police to train in, I don't know how many places we send police to train in, but if we're sending them to train with military units or police units in a foreign country that openly practice racial profiling and we send them to learn from them, we probably shouldn't be doing that. Why do we send them abroad when racial profiling is perfectly acceptable in the United States? Like the Supreme Court has ruled that racial profiling is a fine, are we not good enough at it? No. Um, hi. Um, so my question is kind of to each of you in turn. Do you believe that there should be a Jewish state, not necessarily Israel, but just in general, a Jewish state? And if so, where? Um, yes, um, I would, uh, I would, you know, the particular parameter borders would, I would support would be, you know, um, along the lines of the Clinton parameters or 
somewhere between the Clinton parameters and the Arab League initiative, essentially, you know, you're talking about um, uh, um, a, a you know, Palestinian state with a capital in the Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, a small land swap in ex of, of, uh, from the West Bank in exchange for equal amount and value land inside the Green Line. Um, the, the more, I think, complicated question is what does one mean by Jewish state? And that's the question that I think doesn't come up enough. Um, what I mean, uh, for me, um, the, what a Jewish state has to, the, the, the core element of, for me of a Jewish state is that if Jews are in distress around the world, uh, this state will feel a special obligation for their protection. Um, that's the baseline. Um, virtually everything else is negotiable, which is to say, by negotiable, I mean with an eye towards making sure that, that Israel's non-Jewish population um, uh, are, don't, um, don't face structural discrimination. So, um, uh, and so that would entail wholesale rethinking of a whole series of things. Um, um, and um, uh, so that's my, my answer. And I would also say that, uh, you know, and I also think that uh, um, to the degree that there, when, there, if there, when in if there is the Palestinian state, um, which has Palestinian symbols, right, which may have an ethnic or religious character, I think in a way one can then see the question of Jew a Jewish state which has ethnic and religious symbols in a different light, right? So, for, uh, um, um, and so I think that, um, that, that the, the existence of a Jewish state with particularly Jewish symbols, I think, is easier to justify from a kind of liberal democratic perspective if there's also a Palestinian state, which also re has representations of Palestinian identity in a way that, of course, doesn't exist now. So I, I, it's kind of a weird question to ask if there should be a state for you know this particular group or that particular group. My starting point would be that people of any religious or ethnic background have a right to live in freedom, justice, and equality with an expectation of security everywhere around the world. And we should challenge systems that don't permit that. Um, if you know that takes the form of a Jewish state, and that can happen in a way that doesn't deny the rights of other people in that space, then I don't have a problem with that. The issue is not that it's a Jewish state, right? It's that it constitutes itself in a way that necessitates the denial of rights to millions of people. And I think that's, that's the important distinction here that we have to keep in mind. I mean, I personally don't have any problem with a Jewish state. I, I have a problem with a Jewish state that um, prioritizes certain Jews over other Jews. Um, I have a problem with a Jewish state that is anti-black. I have a problem with a Jewish state that doesn't afford equality to all of its citizens. Um, but I don't have anything against like the, the existence of the state of Israel as a Jewish state, but I think Israel really needs to consider whether a Jewish state in its current form is the de democratic state that was envisioned. And um, then it gets into academic questions of how we're defining democracy, but uh, I'll save that for another time. But like I said, I, I, I don't have a problem with a Jewish state, but I do have a problem with a Jewish state that is exception, exceptional for some and oppressive for others. I think we have time for one, one or two more, maybe two more questions. Yeah. Hi, as a, uh, a, a publicly outspoken and published uh, Zionist and, and big Israel supporter on campus. I've been told by a number of members, not just of, of students of Justice of Palestine, but generally of pro-Palestine students on campus that because they recognize some of my views before conversation with me, uh, they see that I'm pro-Israel. And because of their uh, anti-normalization policies, they just walk away. They, they refuse to interact or speak with me, and uh, I'm curious what all of your understandings of anti-normalization policies are and what your thoughts on them are. I'll take this one first, because um, that's something that's always lobbied at the organization I work for, the Olive Tree Initiative, that we're engaging in normalization of the conflict because we take a narrative-based approach. Um, 
Now, here's the deal. We don't. Um, but the reason we don't is because I think there's something to be said about dialogue. I mean, dialogue is so important to understanding and moving past these conflicts. Um, but dialogue in a certain manner, narrative analysis in a certain manner, okay? So one of the things I don't believe in is um, presenting and engaging with each other's narratives in a way that makes it seem like all narratives are equal in power. Um, I think that as soon as you recognize, narratives are a good way to engage with folks because we all come into conversations with our own narratives. Right? And as soon as we recognize that, that I'm entering this conversation with my own narrative that's gonna limit certain information and amplify others, and you're gonna come into this conversation with your own narrative. Once we get that out of the way, we're on equal ground, right? But we have to acknowledge that as we share our narratives, we have to then place it within the context of power differences, of power imbalances. So I think that's how you don't normalize, but you engage in dialogue. Okay, I think it's important to talk to one another, especially if you're going to be an activist. I believe that if you want to take down the other side, you better know what the other side is saying. Okay, and so I think there's so much value in dialogue. There's value from an activist perspective. There's value from an educational perspective, right? You're, I think it's really, um, we think of ourselves too highly if we think we know everything without engaging with the other side. Right? And it also suggests that the other side exists when we may have much more common ground than you think. So I think engaging in dialogue, but then recognizing that the dialogue we're engaged in is also supported by power differences is really important to not normalizing the narratives that we're bringing forth. Look, people make their own individual decisions about who they want to engage in conversation with or not engage in conversation with. Um, I, I personally am willing to talk with anybody about these issues for a certain period of time. And if I realize there's really no point in engaging anymore, I'm probably not going to engage in it anymore. On an individual level, that's the way that I deal with it. That's a little bit different than anti-normalization policies, though, which relate to, to, to other things. And one of the problems with, with dialogue, and where I would respectfully disagree, disagree not, that, not that dialogue isn't important, of course it is, but too often, particularly on, on, on issues relating to Israel, Palestine, dialogue is treated as this sort of this missing piece that if only there was dialogue then we would be able to solve the problem, right? If only we can get the Israelis and Palestinians to talk to each other. If only we can get that 700-pound man and that 100-pound man in a room to talk out their differences, right? They'll see each other's humanity and, and everything will be hunky-dory after that. Um, that. That's just not the issue here, right? It, you, you come to a, a, an honest conversation with a recognition of the other person's humanity, I think has got to be a starting point, right? But if the positions that you hold are that, you know, my human rights are something that's okay to be denied, right? Or you support policies that deny my human rights. Before we enter the conversation, you are already, right, denying my humanity. What's the point in that conversation? I mean, I, will, I would talk to you because I think that everybody's mind could be changed, right, if you enter in honestly. And I'm even willing to sacrifice in, in a conversation that, that f fundamental problem, right? But I totally understand people who don't want to, right? In the same way I understand that some, you know, some people don't want to talk to white supremacists, you know? Uh, I, I'm not really interested in talking to a white supremacist. That doesn't mean that their mind can't be changed. That doesn't mean that they're not human. Right? I don't want to waste my time with it, and, and I, I have the right to do that, right? So, you know, I, but these, again, fundamentally different things from when it comes to the anti normalization policies that we, we talk about when it comes to BDS. Um, I guess I would just say I, I think it's unfortunate if people are not willing to talk to you. Um, um, and, um, uh, you know, Yusuf makes an interesting point about people, you know, why should I, you know, maybe there's a good reason not to talk to someone who doesn't accept my basic human rights. But the, then the problem becomes, if you don't talk to that person and you don't actually listen to them explain it in their own terms, how can you be so 100% sure that that's actually what they believe, right? Or that, the way that, that that's, that's the way they see what they believe. So I, I think that, I think that um, it's, 
really important. I think people owe you the, the respect to listen to you and to engage with you civilly uh, and to be open-minded. And I think you should model that behavior, right? It says in, it says in Pirkei Avot, who is wise, he who learns, sorry for the gender language, but it's written a long time ago, who is wise, he who learns from all people, right? So I think that to the, to the degree that, that people in the Jewish community or, or Zionists want the people to be willing to learn from them, uh, and I think they, uh, they, we do have things to teach, then we also need to question why is it that in Jewish schools and synagogues and Hillel's you never have Palestinian speakers? Why can a kid go through 12 years of Jewish day school and never read a book by a Palestinian, right? So we also have a lot of work to do ourselves, it seems to me, in modeling that willingness to listen and engage that we want from the other side. I know there are many other qu hands up in the air. I hate to dis stop the discussion, but we did say it was going to be over at quarter after six. We ha You have the opportunity to keep talking as part of our reception afterwards. There's a lot of food out there. Uh, please keep the conversation going. This was very helpful, and please join me in thanking our panel.